Swedish designers have a good reputation. It doesn't matter what they produce, be it chainsaws or trucks, they build high quality and well thought out mechanisms. Perhaps this is their national trait. It's also true for the Swedish tanks. The country, which hasn't been in a war for the last 100 years, was able to create its own tank building school. During the First and Second World Wars, Sweden remained a neutral country and didn't fight. However, the Swedes paid close attention to the militaries. They became interested in tanks right after these vehicles appeared at the end of World War I. At first, they wanted to buy a vehicle from the inventors of this new weapon, the British. The British set the price at 40,000 Swedish kroner for their Mark tank. It was too expensive and the deal fell through. The Swedes bought their first tank from the Germans after the war. The most famous German vehicle of the World War I era is the A7V, designed by Joseph Vollmer. It was huge, like a moving fortress, and had the largest number of crewmen in history. But Sweden needed another vehicle, which was disregarded by the German generals. Being a smart man, Vollmer realized that the vehicle was a bit expensive, even for Germany. That's why, at the same time, he was developing a lighter and cheaper tank, which utilized a greater number of car parts. This tank was designated the LK-2. The machine gun and cannon versions of this tank were developed, so the Swedes were particularly interested in this vehicle. The LK-2 cost the Swedes half as much as the British rhomboid, 18,000 kroner. These tanks in 1921, it was a big secrecy. And that is for two reasons. The first, they didn't want to tell the world that Sweden actually bought tanks from Germany. So in the papers, they were uh, designed as tractor parts. The other reason is that it has been said, uh, we haven't found any document, but it has been said that these tanks were not uh, intended to use against an enemy from another country. But if Sweden would have had a revolution, these tanks should have been used to protect the king and the government against the revolution in Sweden. So there were two reasons to keep this secret. So the German LK2 became a Scandinavian named the Streetswagen FM21. For some time, the Swedish military decided that it was enough. The Swedes were just running different tests on this tank. They tried to understand what it was and how much they needed it. Having summarized their experience, the Swedish military defined the requirements for a new tank in the late 1920s. Besides the traditional requests of a bigger gun and thicker armor, the Swedish specificity was also taken into consideration. A poor Nordic country. The Swedish north was a completely wild area where the Laplanders roamed on reindeer. The population was low, industry was underdeveloped. There were many forests, lakes, rivers and other obstacles in the country that were hard for the tanks to overcome. The Swedes had to keep in mind that there wasn't a lot of money in the treasury. They couldn't build everything they wanted. But sometimes they also remembered an old proverb, we're not rich enough to buy cheap things, and try to design expensive and high quality things. Among other things, their own tank program meant a certain share of confidence in the future. And if you look at post-war Europe, you'll see that everyone was working on tank development, even Germany, who weren't allowed to. So the Swedish military ordered a light vehicle weighing no more than 12 tons, so that most bridges could cope with their weight. A tank should not only fight well, but also reach the battlefield in time. It was a very strict requirement at the time. Track durability in the 1920s was poor. Tanks couldn't go long distances under their own power, just a few dozen kilometers. A combined wheel and track laying system became a solution. Tanks should move on tracks when in battle and on wheels when on the road. Such a vehicle was introduced by the Landswerk company. The L5 tank was lightly armored and armed with a 37mm gun and two machine guns. The main feature of the vehicle was its original running gear. The tank had a normal track laying mover, as well as four large wheels. Moreover, the transition from one mover to another didn't require much crew effort. A special system was designed for this, and it took a couple of minutes to do so. The tank rolled to the battlefield, the tanker pulled a couple of levers, and the vehicle switched to tracks. The tank didn't pass the trials. 
but two vehicles were built on its base. The tracked L10 and the combined tracked and wheeled L30. Regarding its armament and armor, it was a standard light tank with a maximum 14 mm of armor, a 37 mm gun and a coaxial machine gun. Changing the mover was done so quickly that it didn't require the crew to leave the vehicle. It was a big advantage in comparison to the Christie tanks. So you have the track system as an ordinary tank to drive off-road in the terrain. But to be able to drive on roads, you also had connected to the chassis, you had big road wheels. And when you drove in the terrain, these tracks were used and the road wheels were up in the air. But when you were going out into the ordinary road, you could lower these wheels and then you could drive on the road with the wheels. And with this system you had high mobility with the tracks in the terrain and also high speed possibility on road, up to 75 km an hour. But the L30 was too good and expensive for the Swedish budget. As a result, only one prototype was built. The military preferred the tracked L10. It didn't roll that fast on the road, but it was simpler and better armored. However, only three vehicles were built. These were the first tanks developed in Sweden. But technically, they weren't Swedish. The Germans were involved in their development. According to the Versailles Treaty, Germany wasn't allowed to design its own tanks. But when something is prohibited, and you really want it, there are always ways around. The German Krupp company bought out the bankrupt Swedish railroad car company and turned it into a tank building branch. It was the Landsverk company. The German Otto Merker made the biggest contribution to Swedish tank building. He was a tank designer that laid the foundation for the Swedish tank building school. In fact, the Germans actively used all their neighbors who harbored them. As a result, Germany experimented with submarines and aircraft in the Netherlands and tested tanks in the Soviet Union and Sweden. And they tested artillery in a great many places. In the early 1930s, Otto Merker started modernizing the L-10. The result of his work was one of the best light tanks of that time. The first mass-produced Swedish tank, the L-60. It weighed only nine tons, was very comfortable for the crew, and became the first mass-produced tank in the world to be equipped with torsion bar suspension. Its first version was only exported. Two tanks were bought by Ireland. Austria and Hungary bought one each. The Hungarians developed their own tank on the L-60 base, the 38M Toldi. The improved variant, STRV M38, entered service in the Swedish army. If we take only technical characteristics, the Swedes had one of the best tanks in the world before the beginning of World War II. It was one of the most successful Swedish pre-war tanks. Its modifications remained in service up to the mid-1950s. The L-60 is the only Swedish tank that had to fight. It happened in the Dominican Republic during the American landing. They were unlucky to engage in combat against the Patton tanks. And of course, it ended badly for the pre-war light tanks. The L-60 was knocked down. Nevertheless, the last five vehicles of this type were removed from service in the early 2000s. The Landsverks were excellent vehicles. But the tank industry capabilities couldn't keep up with the desire of the Swedes to equip the army with tanks as soon as possible. The example of the neighboring Denmark and Norway, which were occupied by Germany, showed what neutrality, not backed by the force of arms, was worth. It was a problem for Sweden, but it was also a blessing. The Swedish engineers were good with their hands, but there were very few engineers, and they couldn't produce a lot of vehicles and make them cheap. In the late 1930s, the Czech Cheka Dare Company developed a small tank, a tankette, on Sweden's request. It was introduced into service as the STRV M37 AH4. The combat value of a machine gun tankette wasn't high, 
but they served as training vehicles until the late 1950s. In order to expand their tank park as soon as possible, the Swedes bought another Czech Adair vehicle, the LT VZ38. Although the Czech vehicles were outmatched by the Landsverk vehicles, it was easier to produce them. If you put one vehicle against the other in an open field, the Swedish vehicle would win. But the thing is, tanks almost never fought in an open field. This is how the STRV M41, also known as the TNHSV, appeared in the Swedish army. It was different from the Czech, with its radio mounted in the turret and engine. The STRV M41 tanks were decommissioned in the late 1950s, but their service didn't end. The thrifty Swedes used the running gear of the old vehicle for the PBV 301 armored personnel carriers. Another vehicle based on the Czech one became the SAV M43 self-propelled gun. Storm artillery wagon, assault artillery vehicle. The Swedes paid close attention to what was happening on the World War II battlefields. And the successful use of the German Sturmgeschütz didn't go unnoticed. The Swedish designers first mounted a 75mm gun in a fixed semi-open cabin. And then the SPG was rearmed with a 105mm Bofors howitzer. A total of 36 vehicles were built, which served until the 1970s. By 1940, Sweden had two types of rather modern light tanks in its tank park. But it was clear that light tanks alone were not enough. In early 1941, the Swedish military defined the requirements for a heavier vehicle. Front armor no less than 55 mm thick and a 75 mm gun. A tank created by the Landsverk designers, following those requirements, was put into service. Its production was launched in early 1943. Unfortunately, during the war, the tanks were improving faster than the unhurried Scandinavians were producing them. A project that looked pretty good in early 1941 was completely obsolete by 1943. When we asked at the Hesselholms Museum why the gun was so short, a museum worker told us that Swedish law was one of the reasons. According to law, the gun mustn't protrude beyond the vehicle's hull. The weak anti-tank characteristics of the STRV M42 with its short 75mm gun were obvious immediately. The Swedes also clearly saw that the development of a new tank or modernization of the current one could drag on and on. But vehicles capable of fighting effectively against the modern tanks of a potential adversary were needed right now. The Swedes did the same as their colleagues in other countries. They created an anti-tank self-propelled gun on a ready chassis. A new long barrel 75mm gun was mounted on the M42 base. Front armor was 70 millimeters thick, but the crewmen of the new SPGs had to forget about the traditionally good ergonomics of the Swedish tanks. The same museum worker who we talked to in Hesselholms told us that the gunner of this SPG had to have pole dancing skills because his left leg literally twisted around the device and he walked quite strangely for some time after he had left the vehicle. The development of this SPG dragged on as well. Although the first prototype was built in the winter of 1943, due to a delay in the gearbox development, the first mass-produced PVKV M43s were shipped to the army in only 1946. There wasn't much to choose from. Until 1953, the M43 was the only vehicle at least somewhat capable of fighting against modern tanks. The Swedes managed to solve this problem by purchasing the Centurions. Sweden faced both financial and industrial limitations, as well as the fact that weapons improve most during a war. The USA, USSR and France had enormous experience in this, and they just had to adapt it to certain requirements. But the Swedes had been on the lookout for what they really needed for quite a while. Like, what do we need? Do we need exactly this? Maybe we should try that, and so on. 
Their post-war program proves, funnily enough, that any lack of ideas in modern tank design leads to the fact that it's easier to buy a ready-made tank from a neighbor than develop your own vehicle. But the Swedes still tried to rely on themselves whenever possible. The most realistic solution to this problem was the idea to rearm the STRV M42 with a more powerful artillery system. Several projects for a new turret were suggested. An oscillating turret with an autoloader, like in the French AMX-13, but eventually the classic turret type was chosen. The LV Can M36 AA gun was picked as the main gun. To mount it onto a tank, the designers had to shorten it and equip it with a new recoil system. Vehicle modernization also included replacement of the engine and other lesser changes. The armor thickness of the new turret was 20 to 30 millimeters. The renewed vehicle was designated the STRV-74. Coincidentally, the STRV-74s remained in service just until the 1970s. The peace after World War II didn't calm the souls of the neutral Scandinavians. On the contrary, the Cold War made the thought of an invasion of tank hordes from the east a persistent nightmare for the Swedish military. Suddenly, it appeared that a new, even more horrific war could break out very soon, and this time things would certainly go bad for them. So, they had nothing to do but start developing their own tank under these conditions. The Swedes implemented a number of original technical solutions in their new tank. The STRV-103 received a 105mm gun with increased muzzle velocity, an autoloader, the unique hydro-pneumatic suspension which allowed it to sit up, and a gas turbine as a main engine, plus an auxiliary diesel engine. The mass production of this vehicle was launched in 1966. The designers of the S-Tank had the idea and the demands to build the tank with a low silhouette, frontal armor that was very capable and a big gun. It should also be very easy for a conscript soldier to drive and to, to use. So that was the major part that was uh, for, for the program for this, uh, this tank. For that time, it was an insanely high-tech vehicle. The Swedes proved once again that if you create a very limited edition and very expensive vehicle, you suddenly get a vehicle that is ahead of its time. In theory, the STRV could even swim. Stalling the system for it took a long time, and the system looked strange. A canvas was put above the tank. It then looked like a glass or a pot with a massive bottom. Its swimming speed reached 7 kilometers per hour. The driver stood on the deck and controlled the vehicle with the help of cables. A similar system was used earlier by the Americans. Swedish tanks are, could be a bit weird, and the, the most weirdest tank is the S-Tank. The new tank was optimized for just one type of battle. It could rise above cover, fire quickly from the ambush position at the advancing enemy tank column, and also quickly retreat. So it would have been a very movable um, battle compared to other tanks. And because of this, it was not so easy to, for, for an enemy to know where will it pop up the next time. It could pop up there or there. So this was the tactics behind this tank to, to move back and forth and to hide and diff, fire from different positions. Although the vehicle is classified as a tank, generally speaking, it's a self-propelled anti-tank gun created to destroy the Soviet tanks that would be capturing poor Sweden. The whole 20th century fell under the motto, look, we've got an awesome tank that didn't come in useful. Despite its redeeming features for Sweden, the STRV-103 was clearly too complex and expensive to be anywhere else but the Swedish tank units. In the meantime, the infantry also wanted their own tanks. Among the requirements for a new infanterie cannonwagen, literally infantry cannon vehicle, were high speed and maneuverability, and the capability of fighting against modern tanks. Of course, something had to be sacrificed. This time it was armor. The new tank had no more than 20 millimeters of armor, 
However, the new vehicle was equipped with a 90mm rifle gun, reached a speed of 65 km per hour, and could even swim. Surprisingly, the project of the Haglund and Sonner company was considered the best. It came out ahead of such famous competitors as Landswerk and Bofors. This company had no experience in tank building. On the one hand, a 90mm gun wasn't enough in the 1960s. On the other hand, the main adversaries of the IKV-91 would be the numerous lightly armoured vehicles of the Soviet divisions, AFVs, IFVs and the PT-76. Also, the Swedes thought that the newest and most powerful Soviet tanks would advance in Central Europe. And even the IKV-91 could fight well against the old T-55. It can be said that it's the later analogue of the Soviet PT-76, a more successful one and with a big export capacity, if only it wasn't so expensive, as was typical of good Swedish products. Besides vehicle mass production, the Swedes experimented a lot. For example, they wanted to create a heavy tank, like the French AMX-50. They built a wooden prototype model, but it didn't go any further. The development of their SPGs moved forward, it led to the creation of one of the most impressive vehicles in the world of tank building, the band cannon. It's quite a unique system. It fires all 14 shells in less than a minute. So, it's cannon artillery with the characteristics of a rocket system. Like the STRV-103, the new Swedish SPG was created to meet the very specific standards of the Swedish military regarding the nature of a future war. In the context of fighting against superior enemy forces, the main requirement for the future SPG was a high rate of fire. The vehicle was equipped with a magazine container for 14 155mm shells. With its characteristics that it had long firing range, uh, the possibility to fire very quickly and when it had fired it could reverse and go to another gun position before the first round hit the ground. So this is actually a tank that the artillery crew members, they loved it and it was probably the best artillery system that we have ever had in Sweden. However, Everything good comes at a price. This time the cost was its driving performance. The designers tried to unify the new SPG with the STRV-103 chassis to make its maintenance easier. But if the gas turbine engine was initially planned for the tank, the twin engine system became a forced solution for the SPG. The turbine was installed to help the diesel engine. The Rolls-Royce K60 was economical, but its 240 horsepower obviously wasn't enough to propel the SPG of more than 50 tons. The second engine became an improvement, but they had to forget about the economic efficiency. The fuel distance of the SPG was little more than 200 kilometers. In the end, this determined the fate of the band cannons. They were sent to storage bases in 2003. The Bacon or the band cannon was a unique at its time. When it was developed, it had good firing range, 25 kilometers. It had automatic loading system and it was independent by itself. And this made it very sp Now Sweden has less spectacular but much cheaper systems in service. Nowadays, Sweden has abandoned the development of homemade tanks. The army switched to German Leopards. The Swedes still have some projects that can be implemented, but Swedish tank building doesn't exist today.